I hear the music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fabulous. Uh, what is it? Friday, Saturday? I, I, I swear Who knows? To God. Yeah, you don't know. I mean, right now, people are doing things at my house, which is like half furnished. It's the weirdest thing. But not it's, where you are now. No, no, where are you? It, not, no, this dump remains the same. <laughs> <laughs> Sweeney but, loves the dump you're in. <laughs> but I, I'm so close. I'm so close. That's Friday. good news. Fr- I know, but it's scary because there's 8 million things that have to be coordinated to make this move correct. Don't you worry <laughs> about like, it. We get done with this and you're all free to go. Okay. Are you ready to go, Buzzy? I am ready to go. Could you at least call me in? Five, four, three, two, six. <laughs> you suck. <laughs> you suck. <laughs> the Jonathan Brandmeyer Showcast. This is the new not normal. All right. If I don't uh, uh, get a job through LinkedIn, this would be another job. I would a company I might want to work for, and this one just kind of caught my eye. The name of the company is Bulldog Drummond. Now, when you think of Bulldog Drummond, what do you think of? The the reporter. Yes. I'm on the forecastle of a tram steamer. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I'm on the forecastle. For people who forgot, this is Bulldog Drummond. We'll go down to Soldier Field right now. John Drummond is live outside of Soldier Field. This place looked like the deck of the Titanic. 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 I thought I was on the forecastle. Of a tramp steamer, 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 steamer. You can talk to me. These people do not want to uh, oh, conduct Lord. themselves as gentlemen. If you're lonely, you can Fans are getting a little disorderly. They get unhappy with what happened today, and we wanted to have some interview. Hey, pull down. Dye it up, dye it up, dye it up. Back to you. Hey, pull down. Dye it up, Back to you. Back to you. Hey, pull down. Dye it up, dye it up. Back to you. He was great. Be orderly here. Call this off. One or the other. Ah, shut up, jerk. Yeah. You know anymore? Bulldog Drummond. I thought I was on the forecastle of a tramp steamer. There he is. <laughs> John Drummond is live outside of Soldier Field. This place looked like the deck of the Titanic. Uh, Titanic. Titanic. Uh, I thought I, I was on the forecastle of a tramp steamer. Yeah. Steamer. 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 Hugh Bulldog Drummond is a fictional character uh, <laughs> in a bunch of movies and novels by Gerard Farley. He is a First World War veteran who, fed up with his sedate lifestyle, advertises looking for excitement and becomes a gentleman adventurer. The character has appeared in novels, short stories, on stage in films, on radio, and of course, TV. Let's kill him. I mean, there's a bunch of movies. (laughs) The Human Google. His name is Buzz. (laughs) He he, he, He was played most often by Ronald Coleman. (laughs) <laughs> and one of the first talking films. Why did they call Bull, John Bulldog John? Maybe that character was brusque and, you know, uh, John Drummond was like a no-nonsense reporter. He was good. Yeah, he was great. Yeah. And they he said was... Him, and they said, him to, you know, when, when violence broke out on the streets of Chicago, it was Bulldog Drummond there telling you about it. Yeah, say, this is Bulldog <laughs> Drummond reporting. I jammed the Roscoe in a button and closed your gap or I'll squirt metal. <laughs> what did he say? You dumb mug, get your mitts off the marble before yeah. I stuff the mud pipe down your mush. <laughs> I'm John Drummond reporting. And then you see Bill Curtis go, what did he just say? Right. Yeah, see? Yeah, see? Yeah, I'm going to get on my gams and my getaway sticks and get out of here. You know what I'm talking about? No. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to fill him with daylight if he comes near me. Fill him with daylight. <laughs> I like that. I like squirt metal better. <laughs> Which is weird enough. I've been squirting metal. I don't. Uh, they detected that in my uh, physical. <laughs> yeah, you're squirting metal, are you? <laughs> yeah, see, I tried. You got to know your onions. You got to be hip. You got to be sophisticated. But you're not. You're a cellar smeller. You're a drunkard. I got circus bees on me last night from that shady hotel. Circus bees. You know what that is? No. It's body lice. <laughs> Great. That's great. 
That's <laughs> great. Yeah. Circus bees. Yeah. <laughs> you heard me. <laughs> now, this is just a bunch of baked wind. Idle talk. <laughs> or just delivering a bunch of baked wind. Yeah. Yeah. Those movies were great, the way they talk mm-hmm. so fast. I mean, really watch how quickly they spoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you got a 1920s dictionary? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my grandpa yeah. gave it to me. The whole show is baked air. <laughs> Guys, around. We can't. We'll be out of work. Oh, we are out of work. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. Got some big wind going up in here. Buzz is out of the, uh, getting ready to move out of his shit box, giving us a little downtime here. And I'm having a colonoscopy, so this should be fun. Oh, wait a minute now. This is Billy the Bed Bug, bitch. Buzz is moving out of his shit box. And your doctor is moving into your shit box. <laughs> Oh, that's cute. Putting it together. That's cute, Billy. <laughs> Seriously. Go away. We're alive right now. Light Your Fart, Arkansas. From Light Your Fart, Arkansas. Mm. I'm not dying yet. Not a day goes by. The Grim Reaper doesn't try to jam his sickle up my keister. That's right. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> They're going to be jamming one up my keister this week. Buzz is going to be moving out of his shit box into his palatial home. Go away. Yeah, he's going. He's going, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but, you know, what would the shit show be without a shit show story? Even at a time when cameras are on every corner, this unidentified man doing the unthinkable. I've been with this company 20 years and never, ever seen anything like this before. Chris Phillips manages Friendly Auto and Warren on Van Dyke. He and his employees are in shock after a man relieved himself inside a customer's minivan. We noticed that the customer started going through two of the cars that were unlocked, uh, grabbed some sanitary napkins. He defecated inside the side of the customer's van. Phillips says it first happened in November, but the man came back in January and rummaged <laughs> through another car. Oh, boy. Like he was on something <laughs> or possibly... Uh, Hold on a minute. So he took a crap in someone's car, then he came back and did it again. To must another have, car. Must have been good to him. <laughs> this is what I wonder about uh, Americans somehow. What is it? What drove this dude to go in there? Well, maybe our uh, news department has the information. Drunk and inebriated. Second time around, he was perfectly fine. Last week, the same suspect went to Twin Tire just a mile away and did it again. <laughs> this time, the man pulls up and stops next to another minivan, opens the unlocked vehicle, and relieves himself. Oh, all right. Does that mean he, 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 he urinated and not defecated? Because if I'm that guy, I would stick to, you know, the plan. Stick, if you're going to crap, stick, stick a crap. Stick to what you're good at. Yeah, you're good at taking a crap in people's cars. You don't change the urination the last minute. Then, you know, maybe he's trying to throw people off his trail, though. You know what I mean? Maybe he's he decided just to pee <laughs> so they could, hey, it's not me. I'm not the guy who's taking crap. I'm only urinating in cars. What brings him to do it? Maybe. It's in Detroit. Well, you know, people, I mean, def- defecating on some, you know, that sends a message. I mean, it really, you know, you could urinate, you could, you know, spill water. Who knows the difference? But, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. That's right. But the, uh, the the defecation is like a major statement, no matter what you're talking about. You take a crap on somebody's <laughs> they're car, gonna, property. They're think about it. That's right. You got to think about it. If you really know, you think about that. Should I think about it, or do you want to think about it? You think about it. No, I can't. You think about it. I can't. I'm busy. Think about it. Stink about it. <laughs> Stink about it. Stink about it. Stink about it. Yeah, I like that better. Stink about it. Stink about it. Stink about it. Stink about it. I don't get it, man. <laughs> I mean, I, who's thinking about yeah, this? You think. think about it. Nobody's thinking about it. The police say the service center cleaned the truck at the minivan in the car with no cost to the owner. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're charging me. If you crap in my car, you're paying for it. I don't care who you are. The Detroit police are asking for public's help for any additional information regarding this suspect who is pooping in cars in Detroit. You'd think they could catch him. Think about it. <laughs> oh, yeah.
I just love to know who he is. I, lo- I love to know who he is. That's all. Because at first he was drunk when he did it, then, but then, you know, he got the courage up, and now he's stone cold sober, and he's still doing it. That's progress. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Brady put out this uh, montage of all the haters out there that said he was done. He was through. Tom Brady has not been good this year. Tom Brady's just about done. He is going to fall off a cliff. At this age, I don't think he's capable of doing what some of the other guys on that list are doing. Tom Brady is an old ass man. His time is over. Unless you believe that he is somehow superhuman, it's a much safer bet to imagine that he is going to fall off the cliff. Coyote style. Meet me. And I know, I think you even said you don't like Tom Brady. No, I, I love Tom Brady. Oh, I do too. Yeah, why do you hate, why would you hate a guy that works his ass off? He's uh, and he's jealous. a winner. Why? They're jealous. Jealous. Just because he is an absolute appears to be yeah. an absolutely perfect person, except when he tries to throw the Lombardi Trophy uh, to uh, to his uh, to his guy in the, in the boat next to him. He okay, got in trouble for that. Yeah, but see, here's the thing about that. And you know, I see he's throw, so he throws the trophy. He, uh, Tom Brady throws the Super Bowl trophy, right? We got we got to assume he was a little drunk. So here's my thing. Then you see this little girl, the little daughter of the silversmith who crafted the Super Bowl trophy. She I goes know. out there and right. she says, "Oh, I'm so." Uh, what did she say again? It just really upset me that this trophy was disgraced and disrespected by being thrown as if it was a real football. I didn't sleep for the past two nights because of this. I was that upset because I, I know the, the passion that goes into this trophy and how my dad and all, all his fellow silversmiths are so proud to make this. I personally would like an apology, not just to me and my family and the other silversmiths, um, but to the, to the fans. <laughs> Oh my God! Stop crying about the, it. The, the fans who loved it. <laughs> wait, wait, wait! You don't, don't, don't. don't you just got to break this down. Who the hell cares about what she is saying? Stop crying about it. Oh, boo hoo! The silversmiths are are really being disrespected by Tom Brady picking up the trophy he won and throwing. He can throw it anywhere he wants. Number one, but the, but it's just a disingenuous little. A cry for uh, you know some kind of a publicity if, if you ask me. See, I, I think that's part of the hate Tom Brady phenomenon. That girl hates Tom Brady, and so you know she's she's looking to blame him for anything. <laughs> I don't even get it. Okay, let's just say they were out the ocean in the boats, they're partying, celebrating their Super Bowl victory, <laughs> and then so went funny. to the bottom of uh, the ocean and they couldn't Somebody's- get it back. Then maybe, maybe they would have like, oh, I wish the, you know my. Uh, Dad made that trophy, my grandfather. I wish they could find it. <laughs> <laughs> we gave it to Tom Brady and it disappeared. And he threw it in the ocean. <laughs> that might be something. Stop crying about but it. But otherwise, lady, daughter of the silversmith who uh, crafted the Lombardi Silversmiths trophy. Silversmiths unite. Yeah, yeah. Everyone. Silversmiths. <laughs> Go, be, get Tom. Yeah. Go get Brady. <laughs> uh, you're on the line. Uh, good day. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a silversmith. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm just shocked at what I saw. He took the ball, but they called it a ball, treated it like a ball, but it was a trophy that a silversmith crafted, and then he threw it, and then the guy caught it. Oh, Jesus, what is this country coming to? I love the Bucks GM, though. That I thought he was going to. I thought he was uh, going to apologize. Bucks GM Jason nope. Licht has epic response. Nope. He just says, "Lighten up, Francis." <laughs> Lighten up, Francis. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Don't everybody got to stop apologizing for everything, man. You got to be There's some some things you have to apologize for. I get it. But this one? No. Lighten up, Francis. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Apologize. Somebody better apologize over there. <laughs> Hello, this is Jim DeCastro, okay. general manager of WLUP Radio. Yes. And I would like to apologize on behalf of this station for any embarrassment caused to listeners for what occurred on Jonathan Brandmeier's show. <laughs> I can assure you that this will never occur again on this radio station. Thank you. 
Tina Fey, you love show business? Love show business. Didn't you work here? Didn't you? You were in Second City here, right? I was in Second City, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, I love Chicago. I, uh, I When I first moved right after college, I got a little place in Rogers Park with a friend of mine. Could you give me your uh, original home address? Because I'm, I do a tour of uh, places that you were yeah. in. 1430 West Lunch. And now if you look on the right, Tina Fey lived right there. It's now a crack house. This is Johnny B. Yeah. Tina Fey hosting the Golden Globes with her little pal. A virtual Golden Globes. And let me get to the big story. Gosh darn it, don't you know, I'm a cheesehead baby, born and raised, baby. Big story, big, big story, oh my God, The big. this is the biggest news story so far this year. In Fond du Lac. <laughs> In Fond du Lac. Jerry and Bernice Schmitz, who've been married for nearly 60 years, are regulars at Blank's Supper Club in Fond du Lac County. Their January 29th visit to the restaurant, however, was anything but regular. Two bites into his main course, Jerry Schmitz was choking on a piece of his prime rib. A surveillance camera caught owner Mike Blank and others rushing to help, taking turns performing the Heimlich maneuver over and over again on Schmitz without any luck. Deputy Jason Brugnink arrived. Two thrusts later, relief in the restaurant. The large piece of meat was out and Schmitz was breathing on his own. The life-saving measures ended up breaking two of Schmitz's ribs and he spent a few days in the hospital. A small price to pay considering the alternative. Didn't think too much of it until until I got home from the hospital. And, Jesus Christ, you know, I could have kicked the bucket. <laughs> people, people in five leg calling me. See this story? Guys, hey, Bernice, how you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> you, can you talk to me right now about what happened to you and your uh, your uh, loving husband uh, Jerry at this uh, at Blank Supper Club in Wisconsin? Weren't you on KFIZ for a while? Uh, WFON, Bernice. Oh well, yeah, that was when they were um, together. Yet, yeah. Were you with? <laughs> it wasn't Mountain Dog Media at that time, was it? No, it was owned by Lola Beckman. Do you remember Lola Beckman? Oh, yeah. I remember over sure. there where the uh, sure. outdoor theater used to be. Right. right. Next, hey, by the way, Bernice, right next to the beer hut. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and they had that carousel there, which is now at Lakeside Park. Uh, Buzz, yeah, if you just joined well, us, Buzz, uh, we just, uh, Bernice and I are reminiscing about our hometown of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Where, well, it sounds like a good time. Oh, it really is. Let me see if I've got this straight, Bernice. So it's a Friday night out. You're eating perch. It's what you're supposed to eat on a Friday in Fond du Lac or anywhere in Wisconsin. A Friday night fish fry is part of the deal. Did you have a brandy old-fashioned, of course? I didn't. He did. He <laughs> there you go. See, you know. Really? Now, okay. <laughs> I didn't say a couple. He had more than a couple. Well, did so. you ever have a brandy old-fashioned? You know, I've seen I've seen them, but I've never actually drunk one. It is, with Scott, you go to a bar. Tell me if I'm wrong, Bernice. You go, you have a brandy old-fashioned, you have some fried perch or haddock, whatever they're serving, and you got yourself a party. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, <laughs> Until you choke you on meat. Have- Sometimes when I'm not driving, I will have like a brandy or whiskey sweet without the old fashioned mix in there. <laughs> right, right. Because, well, um, you said you said something weird there, I, and I think I talked over. You said that your husband, who choked on the prime rib and caused everyone to try to give him the Heimlich maneuver, he had a few old fashions. He had more than one anyway, and he had more than a couple, so. Yeah, that's <laughs> it, there you go. I didn't take count because he had some at home yet before we even started sure. out. Oh, yeah. yeah, you know that's right. You got a, a couple of, I don't know he had more than a couple. Who cares, right? Who cares? <laughs> but here's the weird thing. So you're sitting there, but the people next to him in some of the photos and the TV coverage, they, they were uh-huh. just they were just sitting there. Well, first of all, let me back up. When I noticed he was so pale, I was taking, I had three pieces of perch, and I was taking the second bite. I just broke off a a piece of perch with my fork. And as I was putting the second piece in my mouth, and as I was chewing that, 
I just looked up and I noticed he was so pale. And there was other people in that restaurant about six feet away. Every table is, you know, people were doing the COVID thing. But there was a gentleman sitting pity corner from me, and he turned around and he just said, he said, do you need any help? I said, if you can, I said, please do. And then he took over, and he was also giving Jerry the Heimlich to relieve Mike Blank. And so one guy was then, in, one guy, the guy came in, he tried. Then the other guy, kitty cornered you, as was, you say. He said, can I help? And then another came. guy comes in. Yep, I mean, it only takes park. one good yeah, move yeah, yeah. to, to Which, clear it up. I don't know if it was lodged so far down already in his throat. Or actually, he ate the first piece. He loves that <laughs> frizzle-like and then that cartilage. So that smaller piece probably... Went down first, and then <laughs> he can't cut a small piece. No, you... he, cut, he cut it bigger. And uh, anyway, not only did he cut that second piece too large, but he didn't doesn't chew his food real well at home here. <laughs> I a lot of times I will cut it smaller. Well, of course, he isn't real happy when I do that. He kind of complains and. I get a little uh, grumble soup out of that, but anyway. You get grumbled soup out of that. I've never heard that one, and I've been there a long time. He, oh, he, he, comp- he doesn't like it when I cut his food smaller. So when you when you get an when you get an angry husband, he'll say you're saying you get a little grump grumble soup. Correct. I like that he, one. He just- did he get but uh, anyway, grumble uh, soup? Yeah. <laughs> Do they serve that at Blank Supper Club? The grumble soup. No, they don't. That's only served at home because that's where he does all of his, what he calls, B-I-T-C-H-I-N-G. <laughs> oh, the, the bitchin'. Yeah. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. I love this. You are the epitome of a Wisconsin woman. You remind me of my mother, my grandmother, and everyone I've ever met. But I'm going to go back to your husband and his choking on the grizzle okay. of a prime so, rib. So he, these people come in. These three, these, there was at least three people that were ch- changing off and there was even a a younger uh, gal that came in there and she said lift his head up and then I turned to my sister (laughs) wait a minute lift his head up where was his head was it in the was it in the coleslaw he was down he was just hit his head was drooping and he was already not only blue but he was turning purple I did not think Mm. oh boy and I'm sitting there I wanted to stay out of the way. I'm sitting there. People think I was so calm. A good friend of mine said, she said, you probably were in shock. Right. I would think so. Because right. I honestly did not think Jerry was going to survive this whole ordeal. He went from white to blue to purple. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> not good. Oh, no, yeah. I, I'm not a doctor. Not no, I agree, Buzz. I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure, Bernice, that's not good when you're having a fine meal. You go from white to to blue, to purple. And three people yeah. Yeah, three. doing the Heimlich on you. Yes, yeah. I see that. So, and, and here, so there's how many people in total, if you can, Bernice, tried to give him the Heimlich before it actually took, before it worked and saved his okay. life? Who was doing yeah. it when it popped out? Yeah, who's the winner well, of I'll the... I'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you do, Bernice. That would be just great. <laughs> so tell me, who... who and fired? Then, Go and ahead. Then his name was Jason. I'm not quite sure what how to pronounce his last name. He happened to be in Mount Calvary. John, you would remember where Mount Calvary is. Sure do. And he heard that call for the ambulance. So he came, he thought, well, geez, Mount Calvary isn't that far from (laughs) Johnsburg. So he was actually, came in the door before the ambulance. And uh, he grabbed, he was tall, and he he grabbed Jerry, and it was two thrusts. They got, he was the one that got it all. Yay! And that was about almost eight minutes. You talking about this interview, or are you talking about? That? No. <laughs> oh, okay. About got it. How, yeah. All right. That's how long they were trying to remove this prime piece of prime rib. That meat fly out? Did you see it fly out? 
Well, no, because I was still uh, talking to some of the other... Uh, you were at the bar, know. weren't you, ordering so it old yeah. Yeah, yeah, Jerry, Bernie, Jerry, your husband is there. He's at the table. He's getting Heimlich from at least 10 people in some of the Green Bay Packers. And you got to fill up the eight minutes. <laughs> he, what are you going to do? They break a rib, and Bernice is at the bar ordering an old-fashioned oral brandy Alexander. Right, Bernice? I definitely was not. I was, and so many people said, oh, you, you just sat there. Well, the most comment that came, it when it got onto Facebook, I have no idea who did that. But anyway, <laughs> everybody says to me, yeah. that gentleman that was sitting next to him, he never moved. He kept eating his food. Yep. And I said... <laughs> I, yep. I never gave it a thought because I was I wasn't concerned about him, and nor was my daughter. But that I bugged me. I got to tell Jerry. you, that bugged the hell out of me. I'm seeing that, and buddies of mine in Fond du Lac are saying, "Did you see this man? This guy was just sitting there <laughs> at blanks, watching the guy choke because he wanted to eat his Friday night fish fry." It was the weirdest thing I ever saw. They save him. God bless you that he's saved. He's good. He's he's doing well. Right? He's fine. Other than the broken ribs, yeah. right? going to take at least two months before right. you know this all heals up will he eat prime rib again oh yes he will yes. <laughs> you would you like to talk to him for a minute sure just a second okay I'll let you speak to him. sure now we're going to t speak this is uh, we were talking to bernice schmitz she and now we're going to tell a story yeah she's uh <laughs> she's something else hello hey jerry how you doing man i'm doing Okay. You're feeling better, <laughs> I had to, huh? I had, to, I had to think about yeah. it. Yeah, and you're you're still thinking about you still love the prime rib from Blanks, wherever else you can get it. You're still going to keep oh, eating yeah. that. You betcha. So, what is your recollection from what happened? Do you feel? Do you have uh, anything you recall at all about that? Well, I remember cutting the meat, and then I started to eat. And the next thing I remember was I was in the ambulance. I, you know, I was. That's it. Woke up in the ambulance, and that's that's the end of my story. That's it. <laughs> well, uh, that's good. All right. <laughs> Jerry, listen, I tell you what I'd like to offer you. I'd like to offer you to spin here on this radio show. We do a thing called the Wheel of Meat. Would you like to play the game? Well, who care? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sure. spin the wheel, and you tell me when to stop, and whatever that wheel lands on, that's the meat you get. You ready? Okay. Okay, you just tell me when to stop. Okay, stop. Congratulations, meat lover. You have won one pound of boneless pork shoulder butt. Boneless pork shoulder butt. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you like to spin again? <laughs> Would you like to spin one more time? No, that's fine. <laughs> You're going to stop at the boneless pork shoulder butt. Let me. All right, well, let's <laughs> <laughs> no, that's enough. I got the bit. No. <laughs> All right, listen, Jerry, it's a pleasure speaking to you. You have a lovely wife. It sounds like you have a great family. And the Blank Supper Club, I agree, one of the finest in the area. No question about yeah, that. They did a good job. Hello? Thank you. Oh, oh thank and you. I I appreciate what your all of your nice comments and uh, well, thank you for doing this for Jerry. Oh, you got it. <laughs> yeah, I, you you guys did it for us. I appreciate spending some time with you. You're a delight. Thank you very much. I thank you Good. again, and you have a good day. And uh, well, uh, the best to you. Best and, to you. Okay. Okay. Goodbye now. Goodbye. All right, there she is, Bernice Schmitz out of Malone, Wisconsin, where her husband. Uh, Jerry choked on some prime rib, it took a team of people to get the prime rib out of his throat, and they broke his ribs, and he kept eating, <laughs> and she kept talking, and she couldn't have been more uh, delightful. Oh, boy. I only wish I could have seen it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would have been just like the guy eating and watching. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute, Buzz Kilman. Don't you have a story about the well, just I, I, you, you, yeah, you did the exact same. You definitely watched somebody just choking. Well, I I made the move mm. to go do the Heimlich, and somebody got there before me, and I returned to my table and resumed eating and watching all the action. But you did try or made did what did you I, just I, lift your fork off the table? Pretty much. You know, <laughs> just one knee came up and then oh no, I don't have to yeah. put the knee back down. 
Well, uh, Buzz Kilmer, what, what did you try to do to save this man from dying? <laughs> well, I lifted my knee up. <laughs> Got a problem with that, pal? And I finished my meal. And I finished and I went out. <laughs> See you later. This is the Jonathan Brandmeier Show. Paging Dr. Henry Heimlich and his son, Phil. We're here. I'm Phil, and uh, I'm here with my dad, Dr. Henry Heimlich. 96 years old. So there you are, Dr. Henry Heimlich, the man who invented the Heimlich Maneuver, and you're next to a woman who's eating. She was turning color. Is that correct, doctor? That's correct. And he does that move that he invented himself, and it shot, what was it, a piece of steak? Actually, a piece of steak with a little bone on it. Does she know you're Dr. Heimlich, the man who invented the Heimlich Maneuver? She does now. <laughs> You're listening to Johnny B. Oh, my God. Leave Johnny B a voicemail at 833-LOONLINE. I just don't appreciate this kind of foul language over the air. For entertaining, not complaining. What's up, bro? What's up, B.I.? Yeah. Voicemail, let's check it. 833-LOON. L-O-O-N. Line, loon line. There is perhaps no natural sound that more completely symbolizes the call of the loon. No doubt the loons were communicating something significant to each other when they gave these calls. Not really. (laughs) Never seems to be that way. Loon line 833. Loon line. Hey, Johnny. Buzz. uh, Patrick Bird. B-I-R-D. Bird, tweet, tweet, calling from uh, Minneapolis. <clears throat> Just listening to episode 37 and Buzz is uh, um, talking about his colonoscopy <laughs> episode. And it reminded me of my one and only colonoscopy when I uh, woke up in recovery and started at the top of my lungs what the fuck are you doing in my apartment? (laughs) (laughs) And then collapsed back into a coma. And next thing I knew, it was a a strong young man nurse who woke me up next and said, uh, Mr. Bird, Mr. Bird, you're at the... uh, Okay. We got it. It only took you two days. We got it. Hey, Johnny, I'm just listening to episode 24, and you had the lady call up about the shortage of lumber. I remember the time that uh, I stole your credit card. I mean, somebody stole your credit card, and they charged $21,000 worth of lumber onto your credit card. And you found uh, you, the only reason why you found out about it is because Lisa asked you, did you charge $21,000 worth of your credit card? That's right. <laughs> credit card fraud can be so funny. That's right. There's uh, the guy right there. Trace that call. <laughs> I go to dinner with Angelo and Lisa and the Millie and my mother-in-law. Yeah. And uh, come back a week later and Lisa comes down to the office. She goes, hey, did you, did you buy $21,000 worth of lumber? And I said, I want you to repeat that question again. And I want you to really look at who you're saying that question to. Okay. Yes. I didn't know. It didn't seem. Like you would have, but did what, who? No, I did not buy twenty one thousand dollars worth of lumber. What are you talking about? So we called the credit card company, traced it back to that restaurant that Angelo took me to. Really? Oh yeah. Did and, your did your lumber? Or your oh no 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 no! <laughs> Is somebody in that restaurant? You know Angelo's cousins. Uh, somebody just took the credit card. And did what they wanted with it. And then I told Angie about it. I'll find out. Don't worry about it. They didn't do that. But try and tell you that for three fucking weeks. They did it. You never found out? No. He said, he, no, we had no idea whoever did it, did it, and got away with it and built a birdhouse. <laughs> and as soon as I'm hearing this, this, this uh, lumber thing, my dad used to tell a joke. And it's, I, you know me, I can't tell a joke. But it was sort of like, uh, here's, I'm going to try to tell this joke. Okay. So a guy goes in to confess to the uh, Catholic priest in a confession. He says, Mm -hmm. hey, you know, I've been stealing lumber. I've been stealing wood. I got this obsession with it. You know, I got, I just been stealing and stealing from everyone I could find. My friends, construction sites, uh, hardware stores, I just steal lumber. And he goes, well, it sounds like this has been going on for quite a while. I'm going to have to uh, have you make a novena. He says, well, I got the lumber for it. (laughs) If you can give me the point. (laughs) 
Okay, see if something like I don't know. That's yeah, good. No, it's I don't good know. Man. I don't know. I'm gonna have you make a wait. I'm gonna have you make a novena. And he goes, Are you give me the plans. I got the lumber for it. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. But my dad could tell it way better. No question about it. All right. Eight three three Loon Line. Uh, okay. This one says Burbank Mayor. What? Burbank, Illinois. Oh yeah, the uh, Burbank, Illinois commercials. Johnny, this is Craig again. Um, yeah, thanks for calling back. My sister, the one I told you was talking about running for mayor of Burbank, Illinois. Um, I don't think she's going to do it. I know she's not going to do it, to tell you the truth. Uh, and I think your phone call kind of scared her a little bit because she wasn't really considering who to have run streets and sanitation when you offered. I think that just uh, pushed her right over the edge. So, um, Hold on a minute. You remember last week, last episode, whatever it was, we were saying to the uh, the guy says, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you call my sister who she wants to run for the mayor of Burbank? Okay. Yeah. And we called her and we said, because he says here, uh, you, you talk smack about to Burbank. Uh, my sister, Linda Kent Cruz, wants to run for mayor. She would totally win. She needs some encouragement. Your endorsement might push her over the line. No doubt she could name you and Buzz Streets and Sanitation Heads. Whatever you want. Really? Yeah. And then we called her and we left the message that we're ready to run. And then apparently that scared her off. Okay. Thanks for, for popping in and, and trying to give her a little motivation. But uh, I don't think she's going to run. And um, Burbank's just going to sink because they really needed a good mayor like her. Maybe you should consider it, or, or Buzz, one or the other. But uh, sad day. I was looking forward to being with the first brother of uh, Burank, but not going to happen. Thanks for calling anyway. Bye now. So that's not going to happen. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Listen, I mean, it wouldn't be fun to be on the inn and... Yeah, you know, with the mayor of some small town not far away. Yeah, I know how it started. It started with this call. Hey, Karen, what's your problem? Well, one time they took my son. Who's they? The cops. This is what I get to hear off the earphone. This is like yeah, a year go ago. Go ahead. So, Karen, all right. So, your kid uh, was taken away by cops. My my son is big, and the cops arrested him for stealing something that they have no proof of. Mm-hmm. Took my boy. Him in the handcuffs, and three cops beat him. Where was this? Burbank, Illinois. In Burbank. Why was he beaten, do you think? They don't like my family. They don't like my son. You must have done something in Burbank to make the Burbank police hate you. Uh, Burbank has come to my house and taken away my dog. Police decided just to come knocking on your door and take your dog. The reason why is because I've got a pedophiler that lives right next door to me. A pedophiler lives next door to you. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. We turned him in because he molested my daughter and a couple other kids. All right. He's lucky he's alive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Now the cops hate you. Why would that be? I was at work, and next thing I know, my dogs are gone, and they euthanized them. They just killed them. Yeah. They took your son away because he was too big. Okay. my son. I paid 300 bucks for my boy to go to school. 300 bucks. One kid went up to my son, started punching him in the head. My son picked him up and threw him on the ground. Right. Okay, I would have done that too. Have you called? Well, you can't call the Burbank police to help you because they hate you. They hate me. Who they can you call for help? I, I'm calling you. <laughs> what am I going to do? I don't know. I'm going to find out from the Burbank police. Maybe there's a reason. You know what? They came to my house the other night. For what? Some kid got stabbed. He came to my house. I tried to fix him up. They came to my house. Kid was bleeding. Dave, go ahead. You're on with Karen in Burbank. I live in Burbank too, and. You just sound like the trashiest woman that there is in Burbank. Hey, what? Honey, be Burbank rocks. Burbank rocks. Burbank says, sucks. Burbank sucks, says Karen. One person says it sucks. One person says it's great. What, does he pay the cops or is he f- them? Hello. <sighs> I would like to repeat what she said because I think it's entertaining. Is that guy paying the Burbank cops or is he effing them? Sarah, what is it? Hey, hello. This is why they call the Burbank residents Burbankians and Burbellies. Burbellies. You know, there's uh, Burbank cops that sell drugs to kids. Burbank cops sell drugs to kids. People show up at doorsteps with knives in their I've heads. Got proof, and, and they're I all welcome. It. Ken, Nobody what do you want? It. Hey, I'm, I'm driving through Burbank right now, and I just got stabbed and kicked in the head. Can I stop oh, Give me a break. I went to jail one time. Oh, boy. Why? Because I was walking the wrong way. Wrong direction or wrong way of walking? I was walking home. 
and I had sunglasses on. Mm-hmm. They came to my house the other day. The keep, everyone comes to your house for some reason. Yeah, it's like a magnet. They always come to my house. <laughs> right? Yes, John. Yes, how are you doing, Johnny? Hey, Karen, I just had a question for you. You ever thought about moving out of Burbank? I'm trying. Karen, if you do decide to move out of Burbank, would you do us a favor? If you decide to move out of Burbank, Uh why don't you tell me the exact town you're moving so we can give our audience plenty of notice? Oh, shut up. This is Johnny B. A 3-3 loon line. Burbank, Illinois is the place to be. Stabbing and killing is the life for me. Land stretching out so far and wide. Railroad tracks around you on every side. There's a place just 12 miles from the loop, but light years from Chicago. It's called Burbank, Illinois. Burbank is a Tony town where half the residents are named Tony and the other half have been impregnated by one. Spend a day in Burbank and you'll marvel at the caring and compassion of its people. Burbillies who will stitch you up when you've been stabbed, just to punch you in the head, slam you to the ground, and cut you all over again. Walk the wrong way in sunglasses down Harlem or Cicero Avenues, and you'll hearken back to a time when the retail stores were full of merchandise, not memories. The cops will cuff you, throw you in the meat wagon, and kill your dogs. Burbank is a resilient town where a runaway's bedroom can be turned into a laboratory faster than you can say methamphetamine. Burbank is a place where trailer trash and pedophilers flourish on the same block. A place where you can send your kid to school for $300, just 240 hours of ear-splitting babysitting, not to mention the money needed to score crank from cops. So this winter, escape the vitality and excitement of the city in magical Burbank. You'll come to play in the snow but you'll stay for the quality blow in pure Burbank. It's only 12 miles from Chicago, according to that great tourism commercial. I don't know why you wouldn't want to go there. It's the greatest. Voicemail 833-LOON-LINE, 833-LOON-LINE. Also, email with this one too have you heard from pat says jackie email brandmeyer show at gmail.com have you heard from pat the complainer oh pat right i'm worried about her i miss her jackie right. thompson hmm voicemail says the same thing johnny b more up buzz right on trim it up please hey i want to hear more of pat the complainer she's a complainer savant i thought my life sucked until i listened to her talk I feel fucking great. Need more of Pat, please. All right. It's the request. I don't know what happened to Pat. She did say the last time she called, she said she wasn't going to call anymore. I think that's where we left off with Pat the complainer, the lady that would just call up and complain about her, her life. Hey, Johnny, it's Pat. This may be my last complaint, but I can't stand being old anymore, but there's nothing you can do about it, I guess. I just... And I look at myself in the mirror and I get scared seeing myself anyway. Uh, and then what's awful is you can't go back. You can't change anything. It's You just, you know, that's the way it is. Anyway, thanks, Johnny. I've had fun doing this. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> that's your last. People ask you where Pat is. I don't know, Pat. I don't know. Listen, you know, in this world, we don't know what's, you know, people could be dead. We don't know. But, Pat, if you're all right, just let us know. She did say talk to you soon. She did say that. But then in the interim, she may have passed yeah. away. <laughs> that was 2020. This is now. Always look for the dark side of That's Pat. Pat. Always look for the dark side of Always Pat. know there's no bright side with uh, Pat. Or Pat. Or Pat. Pat, we hope you're okay. This is Jonathan Brandmeier. In this movie, uh, Borat, you did uh, hurt some people's feelings. They, The girl that uh, produced the show in Jackson, Mississippi. Yes. You were on a TV show. Do you remember that? Yes, I was on a television show. Yes, and you were being interviewed, and the girl that booked you on that show, she said that she has never been able to find a job because she booked you on the show, and she didn't know you were going to be so crazy. I am now uh, giving her official invite to come and work in Kazakhstan. She can plow the fields near my house. 
And I will give her a luxury cage. Yeah, she says, because of you, my boss lost faith in my abilities and second-guessed everything I did thereafter. I spiraled into depression, she said, after booking you. This is the voice of a nagging woman. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Johnny the Monkey. The Jonathan Brandmeier Showcast. Johnny B! This is the new Not Normal. Yeah! That's right. I still like Borat. The movie? Like them both. Um, email brandmeiershow at gmail.com. Just a couple here. Uh, hey, Johnny B, I like to keep... Oh, okay, Roger Shoemaker. Hey, Johnny B, I'd like to keep this short, like your manhood. <laughs> that's, that's easy and cheap Come right on. since the movie man thinks he's the second coming of Howard Hughes sitting in his panic room with nothing to do but count his fat sacks of cash maybe you should have him on a show more often I reached out to him to see if there's anything he saw that he wanted to talk about he didn't what's up with him I don't I mean, know what, it comes and goes I, I don't know I don't know what you mean I mean it's not like a weekly thing I don't know what it is he, can, he, can, he literally can call anytime he wants. He's gone through some changes that I don't understand. Yeah, I, I don't know. But, you know, like I say, I can, um, I say anything you want to talk about this week, I'll have to pass. And he said, he, I can spend my time. He literally said, I can spend my time um, memorializing. You must can spend your time memorializing Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> That's what he said to me. <laughs> was he being ironic? <laughs> was he being, what was he being? Yeah, he was being ironic, of course. Because a <laughs> lot of people, you know, say that and aren't ironic. That's right. I, I know, but he was, I think he was saying we can spend yeah. our time memorializing him. I, I'll, I'll memorialize him right now. Ah, there it is, the <laughs> sobbing, symbolizing the sadness all over America as the <laughs> final segment of the program today has arrived. We got to go. We're out of here. See you. Be good. There it is. All right. He was, uh, I mean, listen, whether you liked Rush Limbaugh or not, the dude was, Limbaugh was a, uh, he was a broadcaster. He knew how yeah, to get was, it done. He was fantastic. He knew how to get it I, done. I mean, there are, he was so objectionable to some people that they can't even see that. It doesn't matter. He was, a, he was the devil incarnate. Here's the kind of guy I am. I shouldn't say a thing about him. I know he said some bad things about me in his book, his first book. Really? Yeah, it's all I know. People would tell me, hey, Rush Limbaugh was saying, I think it was something like, I ruined television for radio personalities. <laughs> <laughs> Limbaugh. Wow. And he could have been right. I'm not sure, but I believe that's kind of something like that. I, You know, I actually should find out what was in his book. Well, I, I can't believe you, you, you don't Never have did. it framed. Let me tell <laughs> like, you. Rush Limbaugh writes a book and mentions me. It's all over my living room. What do you know about me? I don't like negativity. If it's negative, yeah, I right. move on. Right. I don't even look at it. Don't even. I would. Right. People would come. Hey, did you see what they said about you? And I, no, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. I'm like Tom Brady, and now I have Tom Brady protein shakes. I'm going to be just <laughs> like Tom Brady. Because he. That's what he does. Right. He's not going to read the negatives. Our movie although, the- although he collected them just for the, just for a sweet revenge. <laughs> yeah. I, okay. Maybe there's something there. If Tom Brady kept all those negative things around just so he could shove it down your throat, <laughs> that's maybe what I should be doing. I don't need movie men to know that I liked to uh, watch Midnight Sky. Have you seen Midnight Sky? Is that with George Clooney? Yes. Yes, I saw. What'd you think about it? I loved it. Yeah, did you love it? Uh, well, I, you know, yes, I did. Okay. I mean, I loved it for what it was, and, you know, it wasn't the thrill of a lifetime. Right. But uh, I find George Clooney fascinating. Yeah. And he's determined to, to be something other than George Clooney. Yeah. I, I thought it was mesmerizing, but you loved it. Right. Ah, bullshit. You love everything. That's loving nothing. He that's loved it. That's loving nothing. He loved it. Midnight Sky, so that's a pick to click. Don't need anyone to tell me to watch that. I, I, I What I'm trying to watch is Miles to Go with Don Cheadle doing Miles Davis. Ooh, and where's I'm, that? Well, it's on it's on demand. It's uh, you can you can find it. And uh, the the reason that I'm specifically looking for that is because Cecily Tyson recently died, and Miles was married to Cecily uh-huh. Tyson, and when they divorced, he delivered a comment 
that is the most famous thing Miles Davis ever said. And he, and he hasn't said a lot publicly. I mean, mm-hmm. he doesn't do it. But they asked him uh, about uh, Cecily Tyson being married to Cecily, and this is what he said. Bitches is vicious. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, be and some... I want to I see if that's in the movie. That, I want to see Don Cheadle as Miles Davis saying, Bitches is vicious. <laughs> Alice Cooper's in a movie I saw. I like it. Rock Camp. It's called Rock Camp. You know what Rock Camp is? I read something about it. Who else is in it? Well, it's a lot of the uh, rock stars. You got uh, Roger Daltrey. You got uh, right. Judas Priest. You got Rob Halford. Right. You've got uh, Kisses in it. And what it is, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, so maybe it wouldn't interest you, maybe it wouldn't. Uh, it's Summer Camp meets Spinal Tap, as they describe it. It's a rock and roll fantasy camp where dreamers from across America and across the world, they gather together to shred, play guitars, drums, sing, and learn to rock like they're legends. Rock Camp is the name of the movie. And uh, Washington Post says Rock Camp, eye-opening treat. And uh, Rotten Tomatoes is 92% fresh. And I, I really liked it. It's, it's, you know, it is these guys who are like closet rock and rollers. And but they're accountants and lawyers, right, right, and they right. run gas stations. And but then they go every year. They go to this rock and roll camp. Different people go, of course. And then they learn how to um, shred, shred with their band, <laughs> shred. And 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 probably closet performers. Probably you know, once let loose, they're probably uh, f- at least fascinating to watch. One thing. Rock and roll will keep you young. And you look at Alice Cooper and you look at these guys and they are rocking right to the end. This is Alice Cooper opens up the Rock Camp documentary. It's a documentary, by the way. That's what it is. And I think you'll like it. I'm 68 and I feel like I'm 28. If I sit next to guys on airplanes and a guy is, you know, got a gray suit on, he's lost most of his hair and he's sweating and he goes... I'm going to be 55 next week. And you look at this guy and go, I'm 20 years older than you, you know, something like that. And you realize that his job, his lifestyle, has nearly killed him. The stress of his lifestyle. What if that guy on the weekends had a rock and roll band? I guarantee you he'd feel 100 times better because there's something to look forward to. It would be something that he, while he's doing his stressful job, he's going, yeah, but... I got to learn the chords to Gloria. Yeah, right on, man. Hey, Johnny, this is Alice Cooper. Why don't you open up the soup cooler and make with the yucks? That's great. I mean, that's so true. Isn't that right on? So true. The music will keep you young. And I I believe that that, uh, the kind of radio that we've done for, you know, yeah. below these many decades. That's right. That keeps you young. There's no doubt. I feel great. I mean, I, 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 I literally, I, I feel the same thing, way about a lot of things that I did 30 years yeah, ago. Yeah, I don't even... I mean, it's, it's just a good time. You don't, you don't ever think about it when you're doing stuff that's that you like doing. I would personally just like to get out of this house. <laughs> and I think that's going to be a possibility. Don't stop, don't stop dreaming. Don't stop <laughs> dreaming. <laughs> anyway, that's rock uh, camp. That's good. Alice is in there. But I mean, but think about that. When you go into a, a place like that and you're jamming with those guys that you just look up to, yeah. it's like, you better be good. This is the Jonathan Brandmeier Show. How's it going, Alice Cooper? I hate politics so much. I'm with you, most, brother. The rock and roll and politics do not belong in bed together. So I think this is the way I get back at politics. If I ran for president, that would be the worst thing that could ever happen to politics. I don't believe the president has as much power as we think he does. You're absolutely right. Why don't we just elect Tom Hanks? <laughs> I would love to see Tom Hanks, although I wouldn't mind seeing Alice Cooper, although you'd have to put that makeup on every single day. What about Brandmeier? Brian, be great for not a chance, man. I know I talked about Brian Cranston before. You know, he was an LBJ. He's fantastic. Um, and the movie, if you didn't see LBJ yet, yeah. Remember, here's the beauty of movies today. It doesn't matter when they came out. I know. It doesn't matter. Because we're all watching movies. We I, Okay, should I tell you what my comfort 
guy to go to when I'm looking for a movie I just don't care what I watch? Who? Jason Statham. Oh, yeah. He can do no wrong. <laughs> Jason Statham may be the most underrated dude in the uh, movies. Right. I'm telling you. Uh, he can do no wrong. That's, there's no question about it. I really and he, like and he guy. And he's one of those guys. He's the real deal. Whatever you see him do, he is the real guy. Yep. He's just, I don't know. I could watch anything. I forgot what I just watched. I watched Homefront. I watched Wild Card, Jason Statham, Las Vegas Bodyguard with personal lethal skills and a grudge. <laughs> right. <laughs> when you got grudge. personal legal skills and a lethal skills and a grudge, <laughs> right. Netflix, I love it. Have you seen Greyhound with Tom Hanks? No. Greyhound, I haven't even heard of it. Oh, you'll like that. Because I'm still looking at uh, World News or something with Tom Hanks. What's that? I, I haven't seen it. I was brand new. He goes out and it's a Western. He <laughs> takes somebody out West to oh. find their son or something. I don't know. Well, maybe that's why we need the movie, man, because here's we do we do movies like people do in conversations at a bar. Hey, man, you see that new uh, Tom Hanks movie? No, what is it? Yeah, you know, he's in a boat and then there's like uh, there's, a, there's water around him and I don't know it's like submarines and he's like a captain uh, whatever that is but you don't you can even have those conversations now because you have Siri you just say Siri you know hey Siri what's the name of the new Tom Hanks movie and then she right. has to talk to you right, right. She'll tell you. Anyway, I just, I just discovered Siri too on my phone. Oh, uh, what is wrong Liter with you? Literally yesterday. Piper, Piper said, you know, you just turned Siri on. Yeah. I said, well, what are you talking about? Well, I don't know. And she, and she showed me. Apparently, there's a button that you can hit and talk to Siri. Right. I've been talking to her ever since. <laughs> I can't get enough of her. <laughs> do, 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 I do the Australian it's, one. It's, it's better than the turtle. I do the Australian Siri. I put her in. Did you, which one do you pick? Hey, Siri. Oh, I didn't even know you could pick. Hey, Siri. What's the name of that Tom Hanks movie? I'm sorry, I don't have that information. Do you like the Australian accent? No, that would irritate me. Oh, no, no, no. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Now you got to try all kinds of them. I love playing around with different series. They're fun. <laughs> hey, Siri, do you know if the walleye are biting right now? There are 31 players on the wild. You can also ask me about a specific player or position. No. Defenseman, Jared Spurgeon. No, no, no. Left winger, no. Zach Perry. No, no, I said... Defenseman, Ryan no. I said, do you know right if the... Right winger, Hello? Matt Succarello. Do you know Defenseman, if the walleye are biting? Do you want to hear the next five players? No. Does Siri have trouble understanding your Midwest accent? Hey there, Siri. What's a guy got to do to find Nightcrawler's Nash Wabanon? Dial in 911, you are having a stroke. No, 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 no. Hey, Siri, find me some... Oh. Finding dope near you. A crepe series. Okay, I found a recipe for crepes. Crepes. Okay, that's it. Hang on there, slugger. There's a solution. It's called Midwest Siri, better known as Cheryl. Cheryl Lazinski. Oh, did you need me, dear? Hey, Cheryl. Oh, hi, hon. How are your folks doing? Tell them I says hi, won't ya? Simply download the new iOS update and let Cheryl do the rest. Cheryl, how far is Lambeau Field from here? Lambeau Field is 40.9 minutes from Manitowoc, if you beeline it. Hey, Cheryl, set my alarm for 7 a.m. I'm going to make it 6.30 so you have time to stop and get some glazers from the quick trip. Cheryl, what are the chances the Bears beat the Packers this year? Oh, <laughs> good one, sweetie. That's a knee slapper. <laughs> Cheryl. Cheryl, add kale to the grocery list. Yeah, no. Okay. Cheryl, add brandy and brats to the grocery list. Now we're cooking with gas. Oh, I started dog, you know. I'm a cheesehead baby. The pride of Wisconsin. Friday night fish fry. You can have the Wisconsin Siri. You can have the Australian Siri, English Siri. And you just got I the want, regular boring one. You just discovered it. You are something else. I, I want Cheryl. Yeah, Cheryl. <laughs> Cheryl Wazinski. Oh, yeah, for sure. No <laughs> doubt about that, eh? Anyway, uh, uh, Brian Cranston is my pick to click. No question about it. Season finale of Your Honor on Showtime. Fantastic. Watch him in LBJ. And what blew me away with LBJ was because they put the bunghole scene in where Lyndon Baines Johnson, the president of the United States, mm -hmm. is trying to get his pants fit while the world is collapsing around him in 1968. I love first, that. First things first. Sure, you got to get your pants fixed from the <laughs> Hager brothers. Now, the crotch down where your nuts hang is always a little too tight uh, because they cut me. It's just like riding a, a wire fence. When I gain a little weight, they cut me under there, so 
leave me. Uh, you never do have much margin there. Look, see if you can't leave me about an inch from the, where the zipper ends, uh, round uh, under oh. my back of my bunghole. Now remember, ladies and gentlemen, that's not Brian Cranston being LBJ. That's LBJ being LBJ. And Vietnam going on, protesting in the street, Chicago rioting, and he's sitting there getting his bunghole tightened. I mean, what the hell are we talking about? Oh my God, that is just the craziest thing. That's the craziest thing. I love it. And he puts that that scene is in the movie. Now, another thing that crotch down where your nuts hang is always a little too tight. So when you make them up, give me a inch that I can let out there. Leave me, me about an inch from the, where the zipper ends uh, round uh, under my back to my bunghole. All right. Brand Meyer. This is Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad, and you're listening to the Jonathan Brand Meyer Show. Yeah. LBJ, Brian Cranston pulling off the bunghole scene perfectly well. Love him. Love his work. Brian Cranston, don't miss the season finale of Your Honor on Showtime. If you haven't been watching that, binge on. That is definitely a pick to click. Brian Cranston in Your Honor on Showtime. This reminds me how great he was the very first time I even saw him. Really paid attention to him. Not Malcolm in the Middle. Not uh, the dentist on Seinfeld. When I saw him in Breaking Bad, I go, this is incredible. Talk about binge watching. You're a good boy. And in life, being good doesn't always get you the things you want. You just have to learn that disappointment is all part of being a grown-up. But luckily, you're not a grown-up yet. Thank you. That was uh, Brian Cranston as uh, Hal. Malcolm. That was you talking to the boy. That was Malcolm in the middle, yeah. Right there. But oh, now, oh, you've gone, you've gone completely off the deep end on this one, my friend. Breaking Bad. All right, you know what? The RV is going to start now. The RV is going to start right now. It's going to start, and we're going to drive it over to your house. My house? Yes, your house. We're going to drive it over there and park it overnight, and then tomorrow... Oh, uh, man, not my house! Shut up! Shut up. <coughs> oh. Wow. Oh, that phlegm in the morning. Yeah. After we finish cleaning up this mess, we will go our separate ways. Our paths will never cross. And we will tell this to no one. Oh. That's what I. That's what I told you yesterday, yes. isn't it? We'll yes. go our separate ways, and our paths yes. will never cross. That, yeah. Hey, remember what I was telling you yesterday? How you know that a show is good when it kind of, when it's kind of people just talk about it? You are so out of it. In the, I mean, I don't even. <laughs> you did half the first show in your underpants. Yeah. In, yeah. Well, that's where I'm doing this show now too. I mean, <laughs> so am I, I thought I'd you know keep uh, some consistency. Uh, right. So what I said to you was keep put your pants on. All right. What I said was I said you know people they still talk about a show and then you'll know it's good. This says. This line here that I cut off from Time Out Magazine in Chicago, heard on the street, heard on the street. Read that. Look what I highlighted. What you highlighted. Uh, the dad from Malcolm in the Middle is making meth in the desert. <laughs> That's what someone said on the street. <laughs> hey, I heard that dude, you know, the yeah. guy used to be Hal and he's, uh, he's making the meth, you know. Th- yeah. He's making yeah. meth. In this, isn't that funny? Yeah, it's out there. It, this this show is so crazy. But you know, it's you you watch this, and even though this guy's putting this poison out on the street, yeah, it is. You feel for him. I felt for him when I first read the script of Breaking Bad, and then I and I had to be a part of it because it was so well written. I, honestly, you're right about that. If you don't feel for this guy, if you don't feel for him, then you don't get it. Otherwise, it's just a cra- you know, it's a crazy show. But man, produced the film and directing. The acting is just all first class. But you know what? Once again, don't take my word for it. By the way, this song is in there when the RV's flying around. Yeah. And you got this song is flying. This is a yeah. fantastic song. You're driving around the RV. You got, you're trying to get that meth lab. By the way, the RV's in is a meth lab, a mobile meth lab. And once again, I will try to explain this because I know you probably explained this to you blue in the face. But tell me if I'm wrong. Your character was a, a chemical teacher, a chemistry teacher. Right. Right. You got, still is. You still is. Yeah. You got cancer. Yeah. You're going to die. Yeah. So, you decide to go into the meth business. I, I don't want to leave my wife penniless after I, you know, crumble and die. So, I, I 
do the only thing that I know how to do is chemistry, and I make crystal meth, try to make as much money before I go and, and give it to her. Yeah. that it, it, What a premise, though. And then you watch it happen, and you're just so stoic, and you're so like into it. But, man... You cooking up good meth? They love your meth. This is the 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 top notch stuff. Yeah, I didn't know there was a there was a. Did you get into that world though? Before I started reading these critics, did you get into the world of meth where they said, you know what, there is a big difference, man. Some guys make good meth. Some guys make bad meth. Some guys make uh, well, it's mediocre you know, meth. Yeah, they do. I mean, it, it's kind of like uh, uh, making moonshine, where you can use great ingredients to make the best stuff, where you can use you know. Toilet bowl cleaner and, right. and still get the same effect. Moonshine. Yeah, that kind of thing. Moonshine. Am I, am I dating yeah. myself? Oh, moonshine. In my day, we made moonshine. <laughs> and we liked it. We didn't need crystal meth. Grandma, take the teeth out. Yeah. We're going to party tonight. Moonshine. Why did you try to pitch a show, show like that to MC? Okay, this guy, he's a, chem- he's a chemistry teacher, but he comes to sells moonshine. Yeah, this fella sells moonshine. Oh, it's a good idea, Brian. Call us later. <laughs> All right. But there this is, tune is cool, isn't oh, it? Oh God! I mean, tell you, when you're driving, it's like as soon as I as soon as I watched the episode last night, I say to Vince Harding, I say, "Oh, you got to find this song." Yeah. No, oh, this thing is like, and you're driving through the desert, Santa Fe. Yeah, you're just. Cra- By the way, I'm actually I'm doing some yeah, of your moves. You're doing the driving. Yeah, thank you. No, Breaking Bad is not for everyone, but if you've got the stomach, AMC has got the guts. Wow, I like that. That's cool. Time Magazine, Cranston, that's you. Yeah. Is amazing as a desperate, conflicted gangsta nerd. <laughs> gangsta nerd. Gangsta nerd. Love I'm that. I'm going to come up with a clothing line for gangsta nerd. What up with that? Gangsta yeah. nerd. Yeah. Cranston is a gangsta nerd. <laughs> I like with that. With my home fellas. It's a brave balls to the wall performance by Cranston, almost literally. <laughs> because of those tidy whities ears, given the indelible image of him baking the drugs in tight white briefs, not wanting to leave the lingering chemical smell on his everyday clothes, the main reason to watch is Cranston. Nice. That's very cool. I mean, you couldn't be it couldn't be farther from the truth. I saw one review that said taking Mr. Chips and transforming him into Scarface. <laughs> that's right. Taking Mr. Chips, yes. right? Well, that's where this the the title Breaking Bad comes from. It's a, it's about someone who un characteristically goes to the dark side. He's, you know, my character has never even had a parking ticket. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he's becoming this crystal meth nut. Yeah. Bodies flying around, people yeah. dying. Yeah. It's all very good. We have got a body in that RV, and it's getting warmer outside. Understand? And we've got to do something about that soon. And in a way that no one will ever find it. It seems to me that our best course of action would be chemical disincorporation. Dissolving in strong acid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, a chemistry nasty teacher. Business. Now, who are these guys that make meth? By the way, if you did any research on this, I don't really. I'm not. I'm not on meth anymore. I was on yesterday. Good for you. I stopped. I said today. Cold when, turkey for, for you. For you, I'm not going to be on it. What is the deal with this? Uh, with these? How do they? If they're not a chemistry teacher or really no chemistry, how do they know how to make meth? Where does it come from? Well, you have to you have to have some basic understanding of chemistry to be able to to make it. And we had DEA agents, chemists, yeah. on our set as consultants, and they showed me the step by step of how to do it. Really? And they you know, they would say, now if we were really making it, we would now take the red phosphorus <laughs> and put it here, you know, and then we'd siphon this off and pour. But there's a lot to it. And the red phosphorus goes here with the amyl nitrate. What is amyl nitrate? What are the what are the, what are the ingredients of meth? Let's let's cook it together. What are the ingredients of meth today? Here's cooking now with Brian Cranston. Well, first put on your Apron. From Breaking Bad. Go. Yes. Apron. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, your oven mitts. Yes. There we are. That's sweet. All right. Yeah. And the, what do we add? Well, let's the... take the brownies out of the oven first. Let's do that. There's no brownies in that. You don't make, oh. no? Oh, no, no. No, no. Um, no, yeah, I did I did learn how to, you know, is the what ifs. If we were really doing it, this right. is what you do. and. But it's, you know, I mean, I, I make light of it, but man, this is a scourge. of uh, This is oh, a horrible, man. horrible drug. And it's going out there. And, and we really don't. We really don't, you know, look at this at this show as uh, glorifying this process or the the actual drug world. I mean, it's really terrible. Yeah. And uh, this character, my character, feels that he's backed in, against the wall, and this is his only hope to leave any kind of money, any kind of help to my family after I go. And so that's the whole motivation to it. Yeah, you're watching it on TV. You see that bus go down, and you see all that cash in the bag, and you're thinking to yourself, "Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute." 
How much? Uh, yeah, this is. How much was that? Yeah, that's right. Unbelievable. Yeah. So the idea is either I I strike it rich on the lottery for my family, or I do this. When you w- watch this show, you you get behind this character and you feel for yeah, me. Yeah. This is guy a guy with the worst midlife crisis in, you in looked the world. Horrible, by the way. Thank you. you Thank you very much. You just looked horrible. I added weight. I gained. I gained <laughs> a bunch of weight. You're such a little skinny dude right now. I, I gained 16 pounds, and oh, uh, yeah. well, because this guy should be chubby. And, yeah. You know, soft. You're, a, you're nuts. I tell you, man. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of yes. humor to it that you really don't expect. That's the weird thing, too. It's like yeah. this dark, weird, there's craziness going on here. The characters are all out of sync just a little bit. You know, who's the dude that plays your brother-in-law? Yeah, Dean Norris. Yeah, he's annoying as all hell. Yeah, isn't he? Right, you just want to sl- slap You want to slap this guy. Yeah, yeah it's like, he, and you sit there right in the middle of it and go, uh, 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 uh. you know what I mean? <laughs> this poor guy. Oh, yeah. boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. By the way. I would think one of the greatest sex scenes ever recorded for television. Isn't that you, cool? You and your wife. Yeah, it's uh, it's my birthday. Uh, can we say what what happens? Sure. Like, yeah, I, you can kind of. I get a, You can say slapping the chicken or something like that. Well, she does for me. It's right. my birthday, and she's uh, working me, and uh, we're actually talking about what we're doing on the weekend while she's doing it, and nothing's going on. Yeah. It's like that's what sex has become for this poor slap. Yeah. And you're just laying there on your gun. back, and she's on, on the uh, eBay trying yes. to sell her statues or whatever it is, or whatever she's made. Exactly. Uh, by the way, once again, don't take my word for it. Washington Post. Now, this is a heavy hitter. Tom Shales. Yeah, yeah. This is a heavy hitter. Cranston is the consummate chameleon. He looks different in every role, barely recognizable for his memorable recurring gig as dentist Tim Watley on Seinfeld. He takes a tricky character and makes him believable, sympathetic, and worthy of concern. You snicker. As you cringe, you wince, as you laugh, Breaking Bad may give you an oddly gratifying case of the creeps. <laughs> AMC, Breaking Bad. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. That's Tom Shales, man. Yeah. That's heavy duty. Yeah, we're... we're, uh, we're- so blown away by the by the reviews. They're very very good. But you know what's really important is that your viewers, uh, your your listeners who are calling up, man, that those are the people who actually. That's what I'm saying to you. Yeah, that's cool. This audience, they get it, they like it, they they'll they'll tell people about it. Now that's the only thing you can hope for. Uh, what is it, George? First of all, your show is great. Um, but I set up a meth lab for some bikers about 12 years ago. It is one of the worst drugs on the face of the earth. It really is, George. When you set it up, when you say you set it up. What? How did you set it up? Where did you set it up? Because he does his in an RV motor motorhome. Correct, correct. So we set up a house out in Arizona. Uh, it had about a mile and a half before the, uh, away from the road. We put explosives around the building. So if the cops did come, we could just blow the building up. Wow. Uh, and let me tell you something. The people you got to deal with, they're scary. Yeah. How'd you get out of it? Uh, I made my money on it and left how much did you make about twelve thousand. made 12 grand what is this a one-time deal for you yes this was in arizona yes why is the desert the place where they're going i mean you're in santa it, fe it, it creates it, it's a, it, it, out, out west it's a biker drug here here in the east i don't know in the middle east i don't know what they're doing here who's doing it you still have to but go to out a, there it was bikers yeah you have to go to a remote area because it produces a, a smoke the smell is a smell it's a it's a very putrid smell and it's very recognizable and so you couldn't it wouldn't work in the city so somebody and, could smell it a mile away who knew what they were smelling they could report that immediately exactly, you yeah. could, that's what well, the guy wanted to cook it in his garage you can't cook it in your garage exactly it's too correct all right. All right. So, George, wait a second. So, you knew you set up the meth lab. When you set up the meth lab, like uh, Brian Cranston's character, you knew what you were doing. Uh, you um, you knew how to make meth. How did no, you know? I, I did not. You just set the lab up for I him. just set everything up. I got paid to set it up and fix it so if the cops did come, everything wow. blew up. All right. Who's the guy you work for then? I mean, yeah, give me his name, please. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, so some guy from the bikers said to you, hey, can you make a meth lab for us? Well, it. Went a little differently than that, but yeah, basically. Uh, what do you say? Some guy said to you, listen, you make a meth lab for us or we're going to kill you. So I just happened to know the people with the explosives and uh, you're um, a- I knew I knew where to get my hands on it. And- you're, a, you're a scary dude, George. Yeah, I love that, George. Fantastic. Hey, George, you've wow. seen the show, really? Because if you made a meth lab, you're going to love Breaking Bad. I, I haven't sat down and watched the whole thing yet uh, because I lived it and uh, it, yeah. it's... It's a very scary drug. I mean, uh, I know people that are dead because of it. Hey, can yeah. you tell me quickly, what is the high you get from it? Immediate. What is the immediate high you get from meth? The euphoria. 
euphoria high is like nothing else you've ever done. And it makes you want more. Well, when you say euphoria, you're just like, whoa, everything is fantastic. Correct. Really? Yeah. You're Superman instantly. It's uh, the, the, the chemist from the DEA told me it's like orgasm on top of the most in love you've ever been with a woman, the, everything. You've just won <laughs> the race. You've just hit the home run. It's uh, all that and more. Oh, and so God. the endorphins of your brain kick in and you have this rush of a high. The, the irony to this is that after you start taking crystal meth, the endorphins stop producing in your brain. And what's left is you have none of that feeling but all of the addiction. That's what's ho- so horrible about this drug. Holy man. Wow, that sounds like good times. Breaking Bad, take a look at it. Breaking Bad, it takes you on a journey where everyday life combusts in an uncontrolled experiment with the American dream. I like that line. Yeah. And uh, you will see this gentleman, Brian Cranston. Very nice to see you, sir. I'm Johnny, Johnny thanks, to you, buddy. man. Thank you, brother. Anytime you come to Chicago, will do. You know where to go. You need to hear the history to see the future. The Brand Meyer Archives. Good morning. Yeah. Brian Cranton right up in there. We're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time. That ain't a slogan. That's a fact, Jack. Well, this episode's over right now. That's it. You remember what I told you? No, what? I'm sorry. It's not over. Yes, it is. It's over. I gotta go uh, do a thing at uh, a place. All right, numbnuts. We've reached the end of another edition of the Jonathan Brammeyer Showcast. Jesus, why? Tell me why? Check out the brand new limited edition Brandmeyer merchandise, masks, mugs, shirts, collectibles, CDs, and more at BrandmeyerShow.com. Just click merch when you get there. I don't understand you. When you visit, be sure to sign up for email updates. Ain't nobody got time for that. Streaming Showcast past episodes 24-7. Blah, blah, cool, you dope. And podcasts on demand, so you could listen to Johnny B whenever you want. Johnny the Monkey. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, wherever podcasts are found. If you want, leave a review. Hit it, Grandpa. Follow Johnny B on Facebook at facebook.com slash Brandmeyer Show. You are erect, sir. Hi And leave a voicemail at 833 Loon Line for entertaining, not complaining. I hate to complain, but I have to. I'm Jimmy Mack, and if you're into Star Wars, check out my show at rebelforceradio.com for Star Wars news, celebrity interviews, and more. I can't keep it all in my mind. Thanks for listening to the Jonathan Brandmeyer Showcast. Bingo! Rate it, comment, subscribe, and keep hope alive! Click. Adios!